Okay, now we're going to take a look at speech production. So in the previous video we spoke about language processing and now we're going to talk about what if we want to now say some words, produce some sort of speech or language. So this is going to be the motor aspect of language. So a couple of things just to reiterate from last lecture is that I said to you that you may be able to hear some language and that's going to come into the temporal lobe. You may be able to see or read some language that's going to come in through the occipital lobe and these are going to be the auditory cortex and the visual cortex respectively and I said ultimately there's different levels of processing where you just receive information where you analyze information and then when you recognize information and then you need to understand that information and the place of understanding is common for both occipital or the visual cortex and the auditory cortex and that is called Wernicke's area and again I'll highlight it with a W and I'll write it down here Wernicke's area and what's so important about this particular area is that it is there so that you can understand or have some sort of thought or experience of what's just been said or what you've just read now the location like I said before you see I've drawn the brain here with that being the anterior or front, this being the posterior or back, and we've got the temporal lobe, occipital lobe, we've got the parietal lobe, and we've got the frontal lobe. Now, you can see I've drawn all these lines, so I just want to highlight what these lines are representing. First, for the temporal lobe, you've got these two lines, and the lines are representing, they're representing sulci, so that's a dip into the brain. Now, remember, there's going to be a sulci on either side, there's going to be bumps up, that's the gyrus, okay? So one gyri, and, uh, one gyrus, another gyrus, so it's gyri in plural. Here we've got the superior, so here for the temporal lobe, we're gonna have the superior temporal gyrus, the middle temporal gyrus, and the inferior temporal gyrus, that makes sense. Here for the frontal lobe, we've got the superior frontal gyrus, the middle frontal gyrus, and the inferior frontal gyrus. Then what we have is the central sulcus, and we have in front of the central sulcus, the pre-central gyrus, and behind the central sulcus, the post-central gyrus. Now what you should already know from previous lectures is that the post-central gyrus is there for somatosensation. That's our sensory, cor sensory cortex for somatosensation. And in front of the central sulcus, we have the pre-central gyrus, and that's our motor cortex. So in order for us to move our skeletal muscles. All right, another area that I need to highlight. So I told you that Wernicke's area is located here. We need to look at Broca's area. So the reason why I drew these lines is so I can highlight Broca's area. If you've got the superior frontal gyrus, middle frontal gyrus, inferior frontal gyrus, Broca's area is located at the posterior aspect of the inferior frontal gyrus. So this is Broca's area. That's why I drew it up, because if I just said the posterior aspect of the inferior frontal gyrus, you would have gone, oh no, what's he talking about? Inferior frontal gyrus, posterior aspect. All right. We know that Wernicke's area is for understanding language. Broca's area is there for language production, to produce spoken language. All right, how does it do it? Well, Broca's area, I like to think of Broca's area as though it's a programming system. If you want something to happen on a computer, right, you use a program and the program knows that this happens first and that happens and that happens and that happens and then it runs the program and all those things occur and it looks seamless. So Broca's area does as well. It has very, all these different programs that correspond to the motor cortex in the pre-central gyrus that allows for our body to move. So for example, if I want to move a muscle or a group of muscles in my finger, for example, my pre-central gyrus needs to be stimulated to do so, especially the part that's there for the hand or there for the finger. But if you want complex movement, say language, think about language, that's a very complex movement. In order for language to occur, for example, you need the coordination of a number of different parts of the body. So you need the larynx with the lungs. You need the lungs to be able to push air out up through 
the trachea, and then through the larynx, which is our voice box. And those vocal cords will narrow or thicken accordingly. We need the, so if I were to draw just very quickly a face up, I've drawn this far too large, let's make this a little bit smaller. We draw the, again, we're going to have the lungs, and there's our vocal cords. We're going to have our tongue sticking out like that, and we need to move. We need the soft palate, the roof of our mouth. We need the pharynx at the back of our throat. We need our lips to move and we need our tongue to move. So all the things in order for us to speak, we need to push air out via our, from our lungs via our trachea through our vocal cords. This part of simply making a sound here is just called phonation. That's phonation. And then we use the tongue, we use the lips, we use the soft palate, we use the pharynx, and this is for articulation making words. And that's for articulation. So just to produce a sound, phonation, to make those sounds into specific words, articulation. All right. So the motor cortex is going to be controlling all these different things, sorry, especially the articulatory process. Okay, what's Broca's area have to do with the motor cortex and how does that speak to this in order for you to say something? in order for you to speak. All right, I said the Broca's area is a programming system, and what it does is it knows what parts of the motor cortex to activate at the right time, so that the upper motor neurons can speak to the lower motor neurons, and these lower motor neurons will speak to these particular muscles. Now, if they're muscles of the head and neck, they're obviously going to be cranial nerves. And I've already done a video on these particular cranial nerves, but very quickly, the cranial nerves involved in articulation are going to be Cranial nerve 7, cranial nerve 9, cranial nerve 10, cranial nerve 11, cranial nerve 12. Okay, so what are those? Cranial nerve 7 is the facial nerve. What's cranial nerve 9? O, 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 to touch and feel very good. G, glossopharyngeal. What's 10? It's the wandering nerve, the vagus nerve. What's that? That's accessory. Now, not spinal accessory, but the cranial accessory. And then number 12 is going to be, which one? Hypoglossal. Okay. So, we've got facial nerve, glossopharyngeal, vagus, accessory cranial, hypoglossal. They're all used in articulation. When we look at the motor cortex, I've already told you that there's something called a motor homunculus. So that means parts of our body that are mapped to skeletal movement are going to be mapped to certain parts of this part of the cortex. For example, if we were now to do a coronal or frontal section through the brain and look into this motor cortex, you would find that if I were to draw it very small, like that, we're just looking at one side, right? That you're going to have parts of the body dedicated to it and what these parts of the body are going to be, you're going to have the pharynx and larynx, the mouth, the tongue, the nose, the eyes, the hand, the arm, the trunk, the bum, the leg, the foot. So what you can see is for all the motor parts of the brain associated with language, they are most lateralized in the motor homunculus. They're, far, they're in this particular area here, lateral, right? Not medial, but lateral. So that means Broca's area, in order to tell you to speak or say certain words, it needs to stimulate upper motor neurons that are located in the most lateral portion of your motor cortex.
All right, now it does it in particular order. If I'm saying bus, it does it in a different order to which I say car or horse or any other particular word, okay? So that different sounds uh, produced through the phonation and articulation, all right? So now we need to talk about how this happens very quickly. I'll just wipe that off. I'll write these up again. So if we're going to have the brain, let's have the brain. We're going to have, so there's the cranial vault, nose, mouth. Let's move it down. Okay. There's the eyes. Let's have that tongue. So they're obviously yodeling by the looks of it. We're going to have Winnicki's area. We're going to have Broca's area. We're going to have the motor cortex. And here is the area we need to, the most lateral portion is the area we need to stimulate. So this is what happens. Actually, let's draw the rest of the brainstem. and spinal cord. Midbrain, pons, medulla. Midbrain, pons, medulla. Okay, I want to say the word bus. Broca's area is going to stimulate upper motor neurons in this aspect of the motor cortex. It only does it because Winnicki's area has told it to do so. Why? Because you've been able to think of bus. You know you want to say bus. You understand what bus means and you want to speak the word bus. So Winnicki's area will speak to Broca's area. Broca's area will then speak to and fire up in a particular patterned way. So the motor cortex associated with the lips, the tongue, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea. And these motor neurons firing off will shoot their neurons down, their upper motor neurons. So the upper motor neurons are going to be going down, right? Whoop. And they're going to go down into the brainstem where the cranial nerves are located. So Midbrain pons at the pons region, it's going to fire off with cranial nerve seven, which is the facial nerve. And it's going to fire off, and the facial nerve is going to innervate the lips. Tell the lips to move. It's going to go, continue down. And at various parts of the medulla, it's going to fire off with very varying nuclei. For example, it's going to fire off with cranial nerve 9. So remember what cranial nerve 9 is? O, 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 to touch and feel very good. G, glossopharyngeal. Glossopharyngeal is going to be the pharynx. That's the back of the throat here. So we've got the pharynx. And we've got the soft palate as well. Glossopharyngeal is going to go to the pharynx. It's also going to go to parts of the soft palate. Then it's going to go, so that's going to be cranial nerve 9. Oh yes, glossopharyngeal. So the pharynx, which is the back of the throat. Cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus. Vagus is going to stimulate the pharynx as well. It's going to stimulate part of the soft palate too. Cranial nerve 10, vagus. And then you're also going to have cranial nerve 11 and 12. That's right, cranial nerve 11. Um, accessory, which is going to be the cranial accessory. And let's write cranial nerve 11 as well, which is uh, hypoglossal, which is tongue. And they're going to fire out pharynx. And then let's do a different color here. Tongue movement. Okay. So what do we have? We've got cranial nerve 7 for facial moving the lips. We've got glossopharyngeal for the pharynx. 
We've got Vegas for the pharynx, soft palate. We've got accessory for the soft palate. We've got hypoglossal for the tongue. And that is the articulation process for speech, being able to say specific words. Now remember, we also have the larynx and the lungs down here. So I'm just going to wipe a bit of that away and just draw the lungs here. Now this is important because, like I said, phonation is being produced, so just sound being produced, and then you articulate that sound into specific words through these cranial nerves. Okay, so if there's something wrong with producing sound, that's going to be called dysphonia. Dysphonia is a problem producing sound. And that has to do with the lungs, the trachea, and the larynx. Okay, if you've got a problem with articulation, it's called dysarthria. Dysarthria is a problem with articulation. So what could that be? Well, that could be these cranial nerves. It could be a brainstem issue. In actual fact, you're going to have the cerebellum here, and your cerebellum is constantly feeding back these from these motor neurons so that you know exactly what to say. So it could be a problem with your cerebellum. If there's a problem there, maybe you slur your words, for example. All of this has to do with dysarthria, the articulation process. Dysphonia, producing sound. Dysarthria, articulation. Now, if you've got a problem with Wernicke's area, it's an aphasia or dysphasia. If you've got a problem with the Broca's area, it's aphasia or dysphasia. Now, what that means is, if you have Wernicke's aphasia, Wernicke's area is to understand language, so you have an issue understanding what people are saying or what you're reading. So, what that means is, you can still see. So, Wernicke's aphasia, there's no problem with your visual system. There's no problem with your auditory system. You still can hear those words. You can still read those words. They just have no meaning to you. Okay? So there's no understanding there. For Broca's aphasia, if there's a problem here, well, you can hear words, you can read words, and you can understand them. But Broca's area is there for speech production. So you have a problem expressing words and you can't speak certain words. You know what they mean. You just can't say them, okay? Because why? Broca's area controls all these upper motor neurons that synapse with the, the lower motor neurons associated with the cranial nerves for articulation of speech. Broc uh, Wernicke's aphasia, problem with understanding. Broca's aphasia, problem with speech production. I think that will do. Hopefully that helps when it comes to speech production and the parts of the brain that are associated with it.